All right, this is Buddy with Mary Lou Hulis again. The next video that we're going to actually be talking about is um, a, the description is aliens in the Bible. Yes. And she really goes in great detail about this, and it's really interesting. It really is. You know, the Bible is a metaphysical book, and science is really just catching up to it. So the Bible is full of astrotheology, but it's also full of those extraterrestrials that have come to Earth to really help our ascension. So listen to it and see what you think and see if you can't see that it's really describing uh, ETs and how they are influencing us and have been for, for thousands of years. So I hope you really enjoy Aliens in the Bible. about today and I thought because Richard Dolan is coming this afternoon and going to be talking about ancient aliens I wanted to talk about aliens in the Bible and that there is so much and I'm just going to really touch on a little bit today you know you know did you know that ancient aliens is number one program on the history channel so that means that more people are watching that on the history channel than anything else and I don't know about you but I have friends that are not awakened but they are loving this History Channel, believe in aliens and all of that. So, so I wanted to show the Bible has a lot to say about people from other planets. In fact, it talks about a time when the encounter with these beings were very normal. They walked with people, talked with people, you know, sat in the cool of the day, in a, the, the tent with people. They called them gods or angels many times. And you know the word Elohim, in the beginning Elohim, is a plural it's a plural. So our Bible starts with plurality of gods, not one God. And who were these gods? And who wrote this book? And that's what I want to show you today, too. Who wrote this book that has astrotheology, genetic engineering, numerology, about hermetics, you know, all of these encoded things in it, and we call it a religious book. I'm going to tell you, I don't even think this is a religious book anymore. I don't, and I now know why I studied it for so many years. But they walk with these beings they call lords or gods throughout all the Old Testament. Where'd they go? Have you ever asked that? You know, we, we just expect it when we read the Old Testament that they were walking around, God was in the garden, talking and blah, blah, blah. But then all of a sudden, in the New Testament, where did they go? <clears throat> so we, we're going to look at some of this. And the Old Testament is filled with information and knowledge that science is just catching up to. They had to come from a much higher intelligence. You see, I brought my Bible today because I usually don't do that, but I'm going to read some out of the Bible for you today. And just think, it's not a religious book. I think of this as a highly cosmic textbook. Let's look at it a different way today. A highly cosmic textbook that has information way beyond anything that we've ever encountered, and we're really just waking up to it. So for years I taught on the Tabernacle of Moses. How many of you have ever heard me teach on the Tabernacle of Moses? I know some of you in here have. Taught on it for years because every little inch, every little part of it, you know, the outer court, the inner court, the most holy place, all of it was so symbolic. But I've raised up a notch and I see it even from a greater point of view now. The Tabernacle was called the dwelling place of God. And God told Moses to build it with very specific instructions because he said it was a pattern of something else. He said, you're going to build this because it's a pattern of something else. Well, what was the pattern of? Well, I can see that I can go back to the pyramids and there's, old, you know, the, the inner king's chamber is the same dimensions as many parts of the tabernacle. But what it's really a picture of was the human brain, which we didn't know for thousands and thousands of years until we could see into the human brain. So how did they know that? And I'm going to show you that. And it, it's, it, it is anatomically correct picture of what is in your brain today. The tabernacle, the dwelling place of God. You, your brain. How did they know it thousands of years ago, though? How did they build, how did they, and who gave Moses this instructions? I love it when he goes up on the mountain and this big light comes down and you know, on and could that have been, an, I, I'm not going to go into that scripture, but could that have been, you know, 
uh, a UFO that came down and gave him that information, gave him the pattern of something different. You know, there's so many scriptures we can go into, but I, there, I, don't, I don't have time to do, to do that. But how did they know this thousands of years ago? Think of this too, we have 12 signs of the zodiac. We have 12 constellations that form the ecliptic path of the sun. Okay, in the Bible we have 12 disciples. In our world we have 12 months of the year. We have 12 tribes of Israel. There was 12 stones in the high priest's breastplate, 12 loaves of bread in the holy place. In Revelation there's a woman with a hat on with 12 stars on her head. You know, that starts to give us a picture of something too. So according to Stedman's Med Medical Dictionary, now listen to this. You, every single one of us, had 12 nerves in the human brain. 12 nerves. It goes all along with this numerology. So we begin to see a connection between the brain and these biblical allegories. Because you really, do you know in the old mystery schools, they used to hang up a picture of, of the body, the human body, and they begin to teach the cosmos through the human body. Because we are really created in the image of the cosmos. The division where our organs are has to do with the divisions of the planets, everything. So incredible. So in 2 Kings, we read about, I'm going to talk about the first um, alien abduction. It's right here in the Bible. So I'm going to, tell, I'm going to read it about you, to you. So in 2 Kings, we read about two guys, and they're walking along, Elijah and Elijah. They're just walking along, you know, and they're talking about all this stuff. And something all of a sudden whisks out of the sky and whisks one of them, whisk them away. And then the guy's standing there. What happened to him? You know, whisk him away. Let me read it to you. It says in 2 Kings 2.11, And it came to pass that they still went on, as they still went on and talked, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both and <clears throat> both cast asunder. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind to heaven. Now, I used to read that for years. And we, we, what is the chariot of fire? What do we think this chariot of fire was? Like a chariot, you know, a Roman chariot? Or could it have been a UFO that came down and just began to whisk him away? And I'm going to give you some words that maybe will make you think that. <clears throat> and Elijah saw it and he cried, and he saw it no more. So Elijah said, where the heck did he go? And who's going to believe me? How many people have seen abductions or seen, you know, these pictures and they go, who are we going to tell? Who's going to believe me? You know, when, we, when my friend was whisked away or whatever, or we saw this thing in the sky, who's going to believe me? And our question is, since we know we, we, CNN wasn't there to report what was going on, who wrote this stuff? Who wrote this stuff in a code, in allegories, in parables, in numerology, for us today to begin understanding it. Who wrote it? Higher intelligence wrote it. That's who a much higher intelligence wrote it. Maybe the ones who wrote the splitting of the atom. Ever think about that in Adam with the ribs taking out of Adam? That was all about the splitting of the atom. Genetic engineering. <laughs> How about the, those are probably the people that wrote this. The ones who knew the speed of light. You know in Israel they had 12 tribes and they were all placed among you know, um, four on the east, four on the west, four, and one tribe was called Judah, and it was called the tribe of light. And guess how many people, when you, it tells you in different sections how many people were in that tribe of Ju Judah, mm -hmm. this tribe of light, 186,400. You know what that is? That's the speed of light. How did they know that back then? How did they know that back then? I mean, this Bible, 5,000 years ago, how did they know that? The ones who gave Moses the specification patterns for the tabernacle that perfectly describe your human brain. In fact, I want to get the picture off the wall back there. I forgot to get it now. I'll have someone get it in a minute. But it's clear someone, some beings, many, many thousands of years ago, before CNN and the reporters were there, they knew something. They knew something before our science knew something. And they began to get, in their language, in their way, they begin to try to give this information that when we as a people began conscious enough that we could understand it, it would be there for us. You see, we've read this Bible. The Bible says plainly, if you read the Bible literally, you're going to die. It's going to bring death. It says it. The letter of the law kills. But it says the spirit, if you can read past the letter and begin to see the allegories, the, the codes and all of those things, it brings life. 
and it brings eternal life. So when we begin to see this in a different way, <clears throat> so it's clear someone with an intelligence way beyond our own knew we would finally be able to begin to decode this book, this cosmic instruction book that is not religious. And I know I could be in many places today that I probably would get a few tomatoes. You know, how they used to throw tomatoes, because if I was up the street talking to this as a cosmic instruction book, they wouldn't listen, but I got you guys here that's going to listen, so it's good. <laughs> but so they knew that we'd be here decoding it. So in 2 Kings, in verse 11 and 12, all of a sudden, Elijah is taken up in this chariot of fire in a whirlwind to heaven. And we just read it, you know, we just think this chariot came down, you know, <laughs> and took him up, but there's more to it. I begin to see that this is a metaphysical book. It's like an onion. You begin to peel it, and you begin to see there's so many layers to it. And his friend was dumbfounded. Where'd he go? What happened? And who am I going to tell him what's going to happen? Thinking, okay, where did he go? And who's going to ever believe that this chariot fire came down and took him up? So it's right here in what people say, the word of God. Here it is. Something with fire, lightning and fire came down picked up this guy, and took this guy back up into the sky with him. So let's look at the word whirlwind, <clears throat> and a whirlwind. In Wagner's Dictionary, it's defined as a, as a moving as, as atmospheric vortex. So out of a vortex came this U, UFO who took this guy up in the sky, right in the Bible. So a vortex, you know what a vortex is? It took this guy right up in the sky. So let's go back to the... Back to the construction of the tabernacle, and I want to bring in the brain a little bit more, which is the dwelling place of God. Remember, where did he dwell? He dwelt on the mercy seat between the two cherubims, didn't he? How many of you have ever read about the tabernacle? So I, I see if anybody... Yeah, a little bit. Well, a few people. <clears throat> well, the tabernacle was a very important part of the Old Testament. They would dissemble it, take it wherever they went. They were going through the you know, desert for all those 40 years. They would pack it up, then they would bring it. And if you, touched, if you touched the Ark of the Covenant, you would die. Because the Ark of the Covenant was sa very sacred. So the, it was made of this gopher wood, which was really a picture of us. But it was gold inside and outside. And on the top, the top of it were these two archangels, cherubims, that faced each other. And I'm going to show you that that's also in your brain. So the Bible says God dwells in a building not made with hands. So what other temple is there that's not made with hands? Who knows where, where's the temple? Exactly, your temple, not made with hands. He said, I'm never going to dwell in a temple made with hands. I'm going to dwell in a temple that's not made with hands. And that's your head. And in Exodus 25, 8, it says, let's, let's make them a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And he said, I'll give you the instructions after the pattern of something else. You know, when you make a dress, when you have a pattern, it's not the real thing, is it? Pattern is just a pattern. What, you, what the real thing is, is the dress. So this tabernacle wasn't the real thing. This tabernacle was a picture for you and I today of something different. And what it was was really our brain. It was a picture of God's dwelling place that, it, that existed someplace else. And that someplace else is in you. Could somebody just get me? There's a picture of the brain with the two cherubims. It's right on that wall where we're going to have the uh, potluck. It's the first picture, I think. Just grab it. I meant to grab it. <clears throat> so inside your brain, the holy place, inside the tabernacle, there was an outer court. Then there was a holy place. And then between the holy place and the most holy place, there was a veil. And the, only the high priest could go into the most holy place. And that's where the Shekinah glory... Perfect. Thank you so much. That's where the Shekinah glory came down. And what it was, was it was the place where God and man were one, that most holy place. So in your brain, the dura mater is called the hard mother, part of that, that would be the holy place, just like in your brain. And the pia mater is called the tender mother, where the Holy Spirit dwells. And this is the innermost holy place, but it's divided by something called the arch noel. And what that is, it's a veil or a curtain. So there's the... The, the web between the Duramata and the Piramata, which is pictured in the veil, separating the holy place from the most holy place, where divinity dwells within you. So what I wanted to show you was, really you can't see it on this one, but there is a small veil between the 
the two parts of the brain. And also, you can see the chair bumps on top. This is such a small picture. I should have made a bigger one. But you can also see the chair bump on top. And what God says in Exodus 25, he said, I will meet you on top of the mercy seat between the wings of the cherubim. So where does God meet us? Right up here in our temple. And that section is that veil. And what happened when Jesus Christ was crucified, which I'm getting ahead of myself? The veil in the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. Hello. When we crucify this ego, when we get still, and we go into meditation, which I'm going to repeat better with how I've got it written down, but when we go into that meditation, it begins to split that veil. And we're able to enter into that most holy place where we can commune with divinity. It is all a picture. And what we're doing right now, and also I just want to show you right here too, five horses within our brain too. You know, this eye of horse is thousands and thousands of years old, and it's right in the middle of your brain. I mean, if we can't see that we are really made in the image of something so, so powerful. So anyway... Talking, of, so when Jesus was crucified, and there was silence, remember there was silence on the earth for a long time? Well, that's, in the meditation, it opens that veil of curtain that we have access to that most, most holy place. And somebody understood that thousands of years ago. Somebody understood that meditation, being still, quieting that ego, would begin to rent that veil in our temple that we could enter into the most holy place, that right hemisphere of the brain. You remember you always said, cast your net to the right. Cast your net to the right. It's always on the right side of the brain where that holy of holies be. So could it be that these beings talking, that were talking and walking with men throughout the Old Testament really were telling them so much information, information that we're just catching up to. I think so many of the ancient texts, the, the mind calendar, the Hopi, so many of the ancient texts wrote in their way words to us today that we can begin understanding. And it was for us. Because I, I've told you before, I began to encode the third and the seventh day. And I could see all the information was coming to us on the third and seventh day. And we were on the third thousand years from the resurrection. And we're in the seven thousand years from uh, the beginning of Genesis. The Bible is a seven thousand year plan. It says, beloved above all things know that a thousand years is as a day and a day is a thousand years and I begin to see there's a code in this Bible every time it said and Jesus went to the marriage of Cana on the third day well that's the third thousand years that's when you live and I live and what happened on that third thousand years they put water in seven clay pots <coughs> hello clay pots and it was turned into wine transformation we're in a time of transformation like never before on planet earth you know that's what I was speaking in women's group and my friend Sandy would travel with me. You know, they, they'd say, how did you know the Lord? How, how did you get saved? I said, let me tell you about the clay pot. Let me tell you the day you're living in. The tribulation's not coming. Something better. They don't want to hear that. They want to know all about, you know, you know, your testimony, how Jesus saved you. So I had to move into a different arena from there. But anyway, <laughs> now I've got to talk to you. <laughs> anyway, thousands of years ago, somebody understood this. And these were the beings that knew, they walked with men, and they knew that this tabernacle, that this tabernacle, that they gave specific in, instruction to build this tabernacle so we'd understand ourselves, so we'd understand where God dwells in us, how to commune with divinity within ourselves. It was always a picture. And it says, and I already wrote this, but I wrote it down. It says in Exodus 25, 22, And there will I meet with you, and I will commune with you, between the two cherubims are over the Ark of the Testimony all things which I will give you. Everything. It says all things I'll give you. Where? When you get still and you commune and you develop through meditation, going in and splitting that veil and communing and going into that right side of the brain. Divinity says there's our community, community with you. So here's the two cherubims right in your temple. On your mercy seat, the place you begin to forgive yourself. This is not a religious book. It's a psychology book. It's a science book. It's an outer space book. And I'm, I'm wondering, I had a guy call me 
about two weeks ago, and he said, listen, I teach, I teach about aliens in the New Testament. Would you be interested? I said, I'd be very interested. He's going to come in January. I said, I've never really studied him in the New Testament. He said, I've been teaching all over, and he was telling me, you know, this and that. He's going to come up and meet me. Come in January. But we're waking up. We're waking up that this book that has killed, I mean, look at the wars that have been fought over this. Look at the deaths that have come over this. Because I'm right and you're wrong. You know, if you don't do it my way, you know, you're, let's fight and kill each other. But if we can understand this is not a book for one religion, not just Christianity. This is a textbook for life. This is a textbook for ascension. This is a textbook for us to really begin to awaken and see what's within us and what we can do. It would change everything. We've been robbed of the truth. We have been robbed of the truth because we've taken this literally. So anyways, it's telling us that these 12 nerves of the brain connect us to the universe. So we, when we meditate, we can commune not only in our higher selves, but we can commune with the energies of the zodiac and the path energies of the sun. We can get into those energies. It's like what connects us. Those 12 zodiacs and the 12 nerves of the brain connect us to, to the cosmos. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And I might tell you something that happened to me, and you may not come back, but anyway. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. So those beings of higher intelligence are communicating with us through this book and also through meditation. Higher beings are, are c contacting us. And that's what I was going to tell you. Recently, I was in deep meditation. How many of you think you've been contacted by maybe people that are not, in, not, in, not on the earth, not in the area? Oh, good. I have five friends. That's perfect. <laughs> anyway, I was in, in a deep state of meditation, and I began to hear the, this group talk to me. And on this side of my brain, I was saying, I was thinking to myself, okay, your family's right, you're crazy. You're probably going to lock you up after this experience. And on the other side of this, on my brain, this group was beginning talking to me, telling me why I do the things that I do, why I'm Christ, blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, it was so real. Once I was able to park my mind on the craziness, knowing my family couldn't hear what was going on up here and couldn't lock me up later, <laughs> I began to listen. And then I had a second encounter with them when I was in the woods in uh, California. And they said to me, you're not from here. And I said, they said, now we can contact you because you're able to park your mind sometimes so we can bypass your mind. So they said, you're not from here. And I said, well, where am I from? And they said, you're way from someplace way past Nibiru, which I began to tell my friend that was with me, and she had had a similar experience. And anyway, we had an experience together. But I, I still thought, you know, when you have an experience like that, it's so real. But then when you get away from it, you go, did I make that up? You know, did that really happen to me? Was I, you know, thinking those thoughts and it comes to me? So I get David Wilcox's book, Synchronicity, Synchronicity Key. And he says that they are beginning to communicate with us through our imagination, which is exactly what happened to me. He says, and if we're open, we're going to get more communication. So I didn't feel quite so crazy. It was like the book came to me at the perfect time that I didn't feel quite so crazy. I haven't heard from him again, so I, I don't know what's going on, but you know, it made it so clear why I'm so driven, why I do the things I do. They begin to tell me that I was really ordained to do them alone for many, many years. So they kind of told me why I had the relationship that I had because I came here to do something alone. But it, it was just unbelievable. Let me see the hands of people that feel like they've been contacted again. Wow, 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 wow. Okay, good. We're all not crazy. It's a good thing. So anyway, and he's saying we're going to get more and more of that communication. So this book is filled with all kinds of codes, all kinds of numerology, allegories, astrotheology, about Plato, her hermetics, everything. Listen to Ezekiel 1-4. Okay. Now listen to this. Listen. You just read this and you go, why all the numbers? It says this. Now in the 30th year, in the 4th month, came to pass on the 5th day of the month, that the heavens were open and I saw a vision of God. So there's all those numbers. What does it mean? This is where I wish Todd was here. It's numerology. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day. When you add that up, what is that? 39. And as Todd would say, you add three and nine, it equals what? Twelve. Twelve. Governmental perfection, perfection. 
This is a picture of us reaching perfection. The number 12 shows up and it connects us back to the universe, back to the nerves in our head that we can communicate with the universe, with the cosmos. We have that ability because of what's in our head and about an intelligence that can communicate truth back to us and wake us up. I mean, you ain't going to hear this every place, that you can communicate with the universe, with the cosmos. That because of those 12 nerves and the 12, you know, zodiacal signs and all of this stuff, and the 12 months it takes that sun to move, that we can communicate, that we are wired, we are created, we are put in this, we are really the pattern that the tabernacle was made after. We're, we're the real thing. That was the pattern. And that we can communicate with the cosmos. And, he, and help us waken up, and, our, and it will open our vision to divinity within ourselves. And in verse 4 it says, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind, here we see that whirlwind, or a vortex again, came out of the north, and a great cloud, and a fire unfolding itself, and brightness was about it, and out of the mist thereof, the color of amber, and out of the mist of the fire. So here we <coughs> see another vortex. What was it? What was this vortex? Could this be a report of a UFO coming down? You think this could be a report? I do. You know, we used to read this all literally and everything. But what if the Bible is trying to tell us that these people were visiting all the time, coming back and forth all the time? You read so many books now and you know that's true. From For us today with a higher intelligence so that we can know they really exist. Remember when we got the story of Jesus' crucifixion. Because what that was all about is the sun got crucified on December 21st, right? It stops. It, it crucifies the equator. Crucifies. That's where we get the word crucified. <coughs> on December 21st. And it looks like it stands still in a tomb for three days and three nights. And then it begins its northern journey again. So it's entombed in the earth three days and three nights. And he was crucified where? On Golgotha. Guess what that means? It means the place of the skull. Where is the crucifixion taking place within you? <clears throat> Up here in your skull. So, so that we can, the crucifixion has to take place in our skull so we can all have um, intelligence to go up into higher intelligence. Then this is also important to us today because it brings the knowing about that our brain and how we can contact our divinity. But why would God want to crucify his only son? All of those things, have, didn't you ever wonder, this loving God, could you do that to your child, somebody that you loved? I mean, we feel like we can't love as much as divinity loves us in uh, this crucifixion, but it had nothing to do with the death of a body. It had everything to do with the silencing of an ego that we can hear divinity So, and how, and how to contact our divinity. So, we, so could this Bible be filled with deep occult symbolism? Reaching out to us so we can awaken, enlighten, understand, and know that they're out there. What if they're all, if right now, people that are really understanding, and I know David Wilcox, in one of his um, articles I read, he says, there's so much in the Bible that we don't know right now. If he says, it's time for us to take another look at the Bible. He's talking about this ascension event that's going to happen. Something that's going to be a, give humanity a quantum leap in awakening. And he feels like it's all in the Bible. And, and I feel like, too, I've always thought that scripture. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, corruption will put on incorruption. Immortality will put on immortality. That's talking about something happening like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. That's talking about something in a moment. And a twinkling of an eye. What a twinkling of an eye means a jerking of a head. When we just begin to get another vision of something, there's an event that's going to take place in that moment. Corruption. Death is going to put on incorruption. That's impossible. No more corruption. Immortality. Mortality is going to put on immortality. Living forever without going through the shadow of death. We're talking about things that are going to change everything on planet Earth and how we believe, how we think, how we live our lives. It's happening, and it's going to happen. I look now why I study this book for all those years, because I always tell this story. When I begin to get metaphysical friends, they say, and what do you do? And I say, well, I teach the Bible. And they go, oh, the shade would come down, and they would walk away, and I would lose a friend. They don't want to hear about the Bible, because people have been beat up by the Bible. But now when I say, I don't teach the Bible, I teach a cosmic instruction book. It's going to change everything. So anyway, so also, guess what the word Mount Calvary means? 
In Latin, it's the word C-A-L-Y-A-I, which comes from the Greek word uh, crania, meaning the cranium or the skull. Where was he crucified? On Mount Calvary, in the skull. You think there was really a crucifixion? No. I don't think so. I think these are all allegories. You can have your own picture of that. But if, I don't know a divinity that really does that. So, so some higher intelligence is telling us as we separate from the thoughts in our skull, it causes the life energy through the solar plexus to rise out of that tomb and begin to sit on the right hemisphere of the brain. This is scientific stuff. This is not religious stuff. So this is what, so this is the crucifixion of the brain, the lower cardinal mind, or less left hemisphere of the brain, symbolized by Jesus, who is crucified in meditation by absence of thought. The higher which is Christ, so the higher which is Christ might sit at the right hand of the Father, which is the right hemisphere of the brain. Why do they always say, and he says at the right hand of the Father, or cast your net to the right? Because it's all about the right hemisphere of the brain. It's all about this hemisphere of the brain where we connect the most holy place. And when that veil is rent, both of those brains are going to become, that's going to be the sacred marriage that they're coming together. So we entered, we, the entire Jesus story holds a cult meaning and it plays itself out mystically in <coughs> each one of our lives. You're going to have a crucifixion. I have a crucifixion. It's playing out. Who wrote it? Who wrote it? So symbolically. Who did it? We did. Or some higher intelligence that came from somewhere else came and included it all in this book and in many other books too. I'm not saying this is the only book. And I'm going to show you how this goes totally um, along with the Emerald Tablets. But let me get to Ezekiel now and show you some UFOs real quick. Got a couple more minutes. Ezekiel 1.4. Okay, I was going to write it, but it's too much to write. Okay, <clears throat> now it came to pass in the third, 30th year in the fourth month, which I've already showed you was the number 12, fifth day, that the heavens were open and I saw a vision of God. And then in verse 9, it says, The wings were joined. Verse 4. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself. So here's this whirlwind, whirling around. And brightness was about it. And out of the midst of it, the color of amber. And out of the midst of it, fire. So here's this fiery thing, whirling around in heaven. And then it says in verse 9, Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went, they went every one straight forward. And in 11 it says, there, there were faces and there were wings that were stretched upward. Two wings that every one joined one another, and two covered the bodies. And then in 13 it says, As for their likeness of the living creatures, now listen to this, their appearance was like burning coals of fire. And what they're talking about, the likeness of the creatures, is the ship. Whatever the ship was, the likeness, it appeared like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps. And it went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And when we hear of sightings, what do we hear? Like lightning through the sky, don't we? We hear these bright, bright lights, and they whip through the sky. And then in 14 it says, And the living creatures, the crafts, ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. <clears throat> and in verse 19, let me just, I'm just skipping some of these, let's see. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went up with them. In other words, the landing gear, when they started to go up, the landing gear went up with them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up too. So they all lifted up, and the landing gears lifted up, and up they all went. And then in 24 it says, And when they went, I heard the noise of the wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of the host. When they stood, they let down their wings. So when they came back down, they let down their, their landing gear. I mean, this is all about, what is this describing to you? What do you think we're hearing about here? We're hearing about spacecraft coming from heaven, landing down, putting their landing gear down. And when they lift up, they take up their landing gear with them. Now let's see the beings that come out of the ships. Ezekiel 1.5. It says in Ezekiel, And out of the midst of these ships came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. 
They had the likeness of a man. They were not little green men. They had the likeness of a man. Let me go to Ezekiel 9 and 1-2. It says it again in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 9, he cried in my eyes, and a loud voice caused, caused them, wait a minute, I want, that was, oh no, I want to use, excuse me, verse 5. And to the others he said, my hearing, go ye after him through, wait a minute, this is not the one you want, no, no. Okay, this is the one. He cried also in my ear with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Every man with a destroying weapon in his hand. And listen, and behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth towards the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed in linen, and the riders in court by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. So what I'm telling you is, this is exactly what the Emerald Tablet say. Hermes came with an inkhorn, a writer's inkhorn. And what happened was, when they landed on the planet, the barbarians came to the plane with all these things to fight them. And the people that got out of the plane had these laser things that stopped them from attacking them. And they sat down and they began to teach them peace. It goes identical, identical. This came right out of the Emerald Tablet identical to what happened. If you've never read Michael Tellinger's book, The Slave Species of the Gods, read it. It talks about the Anunnaki's and also the Emerald Tablet. This is exactly what happened. You know, in our evolution, we had those barbarians, and then we always had that me missing link that we haven't found. Where was that missing link? Well, the missing link was when these guys came down and they began to do uh, genetic engineering, and create, you know, it says the sons of God came and saw the daughters of man were fair. And they had intercourse and they mated with them. And they began to have children. So what we had were these hybrids. Have you ever seen the first pharaohs of yes. Egypt, their heads? Yes. How they're all uh -huh. elongated heads? Well, they were hybrids. You know, we, where did we come from? What happened to that link, you know, that we don't know about? They don't talk about it. See, the Bible talks about those things. So this is identical, identical to the to the emerald tablets. Let me just see what else I have to know what to say. Okay, this is the description of, of Hermes. And the same story that we looked at in Ezekiel 10 1. Let me just get that one. It says, And then I looked and behold, in the firmament, in the sky, that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared above the head of was a sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a of a throne. So we see these UFOs were introduced to the tabernacle. They were calling them these cherubims. So what we're seeing is not only the cherubims in us, but they're also in others. What it's really telling us. So we're seeing occult descriptions of cherubims in the tabernacle and cherubims in our mind. And in verse 2 it says this. <clears throat> and he spoke unto a man clothed with linen. He said, go in between the wheel." even under the cherubim, even under the thing, from between the cherubim, and scattered them over the city in my sight. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house, which when the man went in, and the cloud, the cloud filled the inner court. Right side of the house is that cloud filling our inner court. And then let me just read verse 4. And the glory of the Lord went up from the cherubim and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the glory of God. And the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court, as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. So what we're seeing is that when we really understand this, when we really understand that we're one with all, all these beings, we're, we're getting this picture that it's not only just inside of us, but it's inside of them too. And what we're doing is bringing this all together to know that we are interconnected with all. You know, they're the picture. They're bringing themselves into the picture of the, of the, of the um, tabernacle that we can see that they're part of that too. And that they've laid that pattern for us to know that within us is where we connect to divinity as it is within themselves. They are probably much higher, we, uh, high, they are higher evolved than we are, and they're trying to really show us something. 
All this is connecting us to our oneness with all that is. Could this be revealing that these beings are the higher consciousness? They know who they are already, and they know we're one, and they're helping us awaken to our oneness, not only with each other, not only inside of ourselves, but our oneness with our brothers and sisters, our cosmic neighbors. Something big's happening. And I think this gentleman this afternoon, he's going to say six reasons why these cosmic beings are important to us now. But we're seeing they've left us a message right here in the Bible. There's so many more scriptures. I couldn't go through all of them. You know, one time Daniel wants to uh, bring a message to the earth. And he, had to, he had to have this war in heaven for six or seven days. Who was he warring with before he could get the message down to the earth? I mean, there's so many scriptures talking about beings from other planets. I could go through tons of them. But I just wanted to lay in a little foundation. And they look like us. I'm sure there's many other breeds, but they look like us. But the Bible is full of it. We are on the pivotal point of understanding things that people have dreamed about. And I can't wait. I hope all of you are going to come this afternoon and hear this guy. He flew in from <coughs> um, Europe yesterday. He's been speaking in Europe, and we waited till the day because I know it was going to be exhausted. But they say he's like a wealth of information. But just begin, how many of us are open to getting messages? From beyond, how many of us know that we've got the nerve center, that we can connect with the cosmos and hear those messages? That we are, that we have antennas inside of us. You are created so magnificent. And we're, you know why we haven't done it? Because we didn't know it. And now when we begin to see these potential and possibilities, we're going to be stepping out in them. You're the ones. You're the ones. And just remember, Pick up the Bible sometimes. Look at some of these things and know this is not a religious book. If it was a religious book and it really had the secrets, we'd have peace in the world today. But what do we have? War, turmoil. Because this book has brought that. Because it's been misunderstood. This has the secrets of the ages in it. Just as the Emerald Tablets do. Just as many other books do. And it's a cosmic instruction book for you and I. And you, just like I heard a message, I'm not from here. Hello, neither are you. <laughs> <laughs>